So a couple of things that I want to accomplish today, we probably won't go the entire time, uh, but is to introduce uh, the, the course, think about where we're going for the semester, talk about some of the assignments and, and those kind of things, and uh, just kind of give you an overview of uh, where the semester is headed. Now, the course is the history of Christianity from the early church to the, right before the Reformation period. Now, I'm going to stop probably around, uh, you know, the, the 1400s. Uh, next semester, uh, if you are interested, there's a course that goes from the Reformation to the, the present. Uh, so we'll, that's why we're, we're kind of making the, the transition there. But in thinking about, in thinking about having a course specifically on church history, Especially, you know, a lot of the people that are, are taking this course both online and um, many of you are Bible majors, and so you're required to take a certain number of church history credits. I think it's important for us to ask and think about why spend the time studying church history? You know, why is it that we require majors? Why is it we offer courses about church history? When, especially for Bible majors, you know, having that as a requirement, when, you know, why require that hour instead of requiring uh, an additional textual course or an additional ministry course or something like that? Well, there are a couple things that I want us to think about before we even get into the, the readings and the syllabi and, and all those different kind of things. One thing to kind of start off with in thinking about this why study church history is the difference between the past and history. Often the two terms are used interchangeably. And so when we talk in just kind of a general conversation, we we'll use history and past in interchangeable ways. But in many respects, in thinking about history as a discipline, especially in thinking about church history, there are some important differences between what we might call the past and the discipline of history. The past is what happened. And so, you know, in the year 325, Constantine called the First Council of Nicaea to address the Arian heresy. That's the past that, that happened at that time in those places. That's different than what we think of when we think about the discipline of history. And, and, and a way to think about the difference has to do with history is doing something with the past. So the discipline of history is making sense of the past. What difference does it make that Constantine called the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 to address the Aaron heresy? Right. Just because the past happened, what, what difference does that make? Well, you know, yes, often the, the, the present is the product of the past. But in many real ways, especially for church history, often how we think about Christianity and often the way we do Christianity is a product of those things that happened in the past. And understanding the past, making sense of it, I think is a good way for us to not only understand the present, but maybe even be critically um, uh, aware of the present. So, for example, why are church buildings organized the way they are? Did the first century church have pews all faced toward the front, and at the front there was some sort of lectern or what we call pulpit in many denominations and religious groups and, and churches today? Now, especially when we think about, you know, many of us come from the Churches of Christ, and one of the things that we have emphasized is going back to that early church right, and restoring the New Testament church. But if the first century church didn't have pews that were faced that way, where'd that come from? Now, I'm not asking you to actually answer that, but I'm asking you to think about, okay, so there's some sort of historical influence 
Right? There's some sort of influence the past has on the present, even in groups like the Churches of Christ that say we're trying to restore the New Testament church. Now, sometimes that can be a neutral influence, meaning that it's not bad, it's not good, it's just influence, right? And when you think about the architecture of buildings, right, certain buildings are going to look certain ways based on who the architect was, the time period when they were developed. In many cases, that can be a neutral influence. And so here's this building that was built in the 1960s, and it looks that way because it was built in the 1960s, but it doesn't really affect, you know, whether this church is a strong church or not. But sometimes those effects of the past, that influence from the past, can be positive and can be negative. And so if we know some things about the past and make sense of it through the, the discipline of history, then perhaps we can be more critically aware of some of the things that go on in the different religious groups we're a part of, the different congregations that we're a part of. It also, of course, reminds us that some things are so firmly entrenched in history or the past that it's impossible to get around it. You may have been in a situation where um, a, a, a preacher or a group of elders or a worship leader wanted to make a change to something to do with, you know, the worship order. Right? And some, so some congregations have the Lord's Supper at the end and some have it in the middle. Uh, you know, and so that worship order, what do you do when? And usually when those first steps of trying to make that change, it's so entrenched that it becomes problematic. But is there really anything scriptural about or not about whether you observe the Lord's Supper at the end of the service or the middle of the service or the beginning of the service? You know, there's really not any sort of um, scriptural advice on that or scriptural warrant on that. And so in many respects, you know, we think about all these things that people are so caught up in that are so important, and that over the years get to be a part of, uh, you know, a, the identity of a congregation or a church. When we come to thinking about history, and, and, and while we're not in a history department, there are some things about uh, the discipline of historical thinking that I that are useful, I think, to bring over into this church history class. And uh, as people have talked about this, this comes from uh, some other scholars. I didn't invent this idea of the five C's of history uh, and historical thinking. But I think it's a good way for us to think about when we look at history, right, or we're trying to make sense of the past, what are some things that we want to pay attention to? What are historians interested in? You know, what makes for a really good interpretation of the past? Well, one of those things, and the, there's five aspects here they all begin with C. One of those things is change over time, right? Historians are interested in change over time because things change over time. And so it's not just looking at that moment, what happened in that moment, but what led to this moment and what extended after this moment. And so one of the things we'll be looking at, paying attention to, is the way in which certain decisions by early Christians then ended up influencing later decisions by other Christians further on down the line. An important part to remember, because no religious group, even Christianity, is static. It doesn't remain the same, but it does change over time. Again, some of those changes positive, some of them negative. Secondly, a very important thing to consider is context. Now, there's two ways to think about it. In looking at a writing from history, it's important to think, all right, what's the historical context? What was going on at the time that this was being written? Uh, what is the, the context of a specific passage in a specific document? And so thinking about the context helps us understand why Christians might have said the things they said, done the things they had done. 
Third, historians are interested in causality. What caused this event to take place? Why do we have, for example, the development of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church? Where did that come from? Why do we see a movement from uh, a plurality of leaders within a congregation and congregations largely separate? When we look at that in the New Testament, how is it that there's this movement towards a hierarchy where there's a levels of leadership and at the top sits one, the Pope. And so historians are interested in how things have taken place. Which means, in, in, in causality, they're interested in the actions and decisions and choices of individuals. But on the other hand, you can't get away sometimes from social forces. And social forces, race, class, gender, other cultural changes are going to influence people. Now that could be something as simple as, you know, you may have seen the list of, you know, how many blanks does it take to change the light bulb and you fill in the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, right? You've probably seen how many Church of Christ members does it take to change the light bulb? None, because light bulbs aren't mentioned in the New Testament, so they don't use them. <laughs> All right, and so, you know, right, Baptist, Presbyterian. Right. Well, there's that kind of mentality of there's something larger going on. Why is it they didn't use light bulbs in the New Testament? Light bulbs weren't invented yet, right? And so there's it's something simple as, as that helps us understand that sometimes there are other things at work that shape and influence people's views and, and perceptions. Right? It's something as simple as technology. On the other hand, of course, there's, you know, we can think of other things, right? Today, one of the really big moral issues for a lot of conservative Christians is the issue of abortion. And what should be the Christian view toward it? With many people, many Christians being uh, pro-life, anti-abortion. But when we look at the New Testament, not much at all is said specifically about abortion. Now, I think we can certainly draw some principles from the New Testament about life and, 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 and what God views as life. But why doesn't the New Testament talk about abortion, yet it's such a big issue for a lot of Christians today? Was it that abortion didn't exist then? Well, that's not the explanation. Abortion took place then. But how we view abortion today is shaped by a lot of the most recent history related to court cases, related to changes about gender that have taken place in our culture, right? things that are larger than just individual, um, individual uh, choices. Right? And so there are things that exist within human life, social class, um, race, gender, economics, all these kinds of things are active in our lives, even though we might not be aware of them. So it's not just our individual choices that we need to pay attention to. We need to understand as well, sometimes there are larger forces working. Ultimately, though, we have to recognize that human <coughs> life is complex. Now, what does that mean? That means that when we look at the past and actors in the past, just like we are today, we are not simple and simply simple describing and describable simply people. Good example of this, not from our time period, but probably helps us under, understand. Thomas Jefferson writes the Declaration of Independence. And in the Declaration of Independence, he declares that all men, in his language, are created equal. Yet, Jefferson also owns slaves. 
what do you do with it? Because on the one side, he's preaching, in a sense, equality of all individuals, yet on the other hand, in his real lived experience, he is owning people as property, suggesting that in his eyes, not all men are created equal. So, we're complex. Um, when we look at the past, people are not always really good heroes and really bad villains. Often, because we're, hit, we're, we're human, we're sinful, you find a lot of people that are a mixture of both. Right? Martin Luther King plagiarized his dissertation. Probably had some effects. Does that somehow negate the ideals he promoted? Absolutely not. Right? The ideals that he promoted are good ideals depend, independent of what his moral life was like. And overall, he was, he was I think we would say he was a good moral person, but he sinned and he made some mistakes as well, like we all do. But we find that these people are complex. They are not simple, just like we're not simple. And probably if we would go through and, and look at all the beliefs we hold, we would probably find our own paradoxes. Where, well, if you believe this, how can you also believe this? Right? If you believe in the equality of all human beings, how can you believe in slavery? Right? Not that anybody in here or anybody in mind believes in slavery. But we probably all have those kind of places in our ideology where when you look at them, it doesn't work to have those two things together, but somehow we do. We hold those things uh, in, in tension. And so, when we look at some of these people, there'll be some really good things about them, and sometimes some really bad things about them. Even as, in the context we're talking about, with Christians. And so, human beings are complex. They're not simple individuals. Which brings us now back to the question of why study church history? So, what do you think? Why should we study? Why should we study, especially church history or the history of Christianity? Well, there's some passages that are very difficult to understand. If you have no historical knowledge at all, like head coverings, for example. Right. Yeah. And so, it, it helps in one sense to understand. Um, that early context, the kind of Greco-Roman context, and understanding Bible, and so that's a part of that. And we'll spend some, you know, about two classes talking about the Greco-Roman backgrounds. What else is important for us to study church history? Well, that's it, you know, so we can understand head coverings. So I think we're going to spend 16 weeks <laughs> just so you can understand head coverings. <laughs> I feel like. Uh, in order for us to keep progress, we've got to first know who we came from. You know, I think that's very important how it got started. So we can know what direction we want to go. Instead of going back in time, doing things back, you know, when, you know, whether it worked for us or not, we still know what direction we're going. Okay, so I'm kind of plotting direction ahead. Thank you. Knowing which parts of history we want to repeat, which parts of history we don't, we want to avoid. Okay, so you know, learning from the positives and the negatives, right? So that we can uh, replicate those things that are positive and avoid those things that are negative. I guess so we can shed light on what tradition has come in to our uh, the church town. We can, I guess, better evaluate uh, through history. You know, is it good or not? How many yeah. changes we need to make. Yeah, I think that, that kind of critical thinking about where we are now and saying, okay, where did this come from? Is this, you know, the, one of the interesting examples I think of is you, you hear these kind of stories of the lives of congregations. Of, there was this congregation that uh, would, on the communion table, over top of the elements, they would have this white cloth, and this white cloth covering the elements before. Uh, communion took place, and then they would take the white cloth off and, and proceed with communion. And the way that they talked about it was in the context of, well, you know, the, un, until we're ready to do the communion, it's like Jesus is in the grave again. So he's covered in his burial clothes, and then he's revealed. That's all well and interesting, but 
it started actually generations back because you didn't have air conditioning, so you keep the windows open, the flies would come in, and so to make sure you didn't get in the juice and get on the bread, you put the white sheet over everything, right? And so you see, all right, these things kind of build up sometimes. And then we try to explain why. Oh, well, it's, it has to do with the death and resurrection of Jesus. No, it was, it was hygiene. <laughs> you make sure the flies aren't trampling all over the bread before you eat it. And we'll see some of that, uh, you know, as you go through the textbook, there are several places that Ferguson will say, this is evidence of the practice was going on and then the theology was added later. Right? And so kind of thinking about, all right, so we have these developments, uh, you know, what's good, what's bad, where did it come from, and, and thinking about contemporary uses. One well, of the other things, and again, this comes from uh, other historians, there is a virtue in studying history, or the opportunity to develop virtue, right? So there's a character building opportunity here uh, in the study of church history, in many of the ways that we're kind of already talking about. Studying history, especially church history, I think encourages humility. Because as we think about these people in different places at different times, it should humble us in the sense that you know, they thought what they were doing was right. And now looking at them, I disagree and I think it's wrong. But what in my life do I think is necessarily right that might be wrong as well? And so I need to be humble about my own positions, right? my own thoughts about Christianity and always be, uh, have that spirit that is willing to be taught by the Word, um, by others, and so by looking at people in the past, I think it can develop humility within us in, in how we look at other people. Selflessness is another. As we, you know, we, we, when we look at the broad sweep of history, we'll be talking about names, not too many dates, right? places, people, but one of the things that's important to realize is that from these ancient times especially, we only know the names of a few Christians. And so when we talk about the Tertullians and the Ignatiuses, and, and the, or would that be Ignatii? What would be the plural of Ignatius? I don't know. Anyway, uh, Origen and Justin, all these other people. They're just small representations of the hundreds of thousands of millions of early Christians whose names have been lost, that we know nothing about. We know nothing about the daily lives, know nothing about uh, what they did and who they were. And thinking about like if the Lord would allow history to continue on for another 2,000 years, my name is probably not going to be remembered. Maybe there'll be a dusty copy of my book somewhere in some deep dark archive. And if somebody happens to come upon it, they might, oh, you know, who's this guy? But when it comes down to it, you know, it, it should encourage us to think that, you know, along with that humility, I'm really not that important in the grand scheme of history. Does God think I'm important? Yes. Does God think you were important? Yes. Right? So we have individual and while well value and worth. That's what it is. Individual value and worth to God. But then we also kind of have to see, and then in the end of it, I'm not that big of a deal. So mystery kind of reminds us that maybe it shouldn't be so much about me and my things, and it should be about what I can do for others. And, and so history should be a part of, of encouraging that kind of characteristic. Hospitality. The study of history, and especially church history, is going to introduce us to some things that you will wonder, because I wonder, and so will you, uh, how could somebody who is a Christian believe that or practice that? But what history reminds us is that we need to charitably listen to people, to understand, even when we disagree. Right? And so that hospitality of, of letting someone express themselves, even though they're kind of doing it through written word, 
encourages us to be that kind of people towards others. That doesn't mean we should be one of the people, uh, you know, this uh, relativism, I'm okay, you're okay, and that's all right. And I don't think we should have that position. I think there are some things that are true that need to be held on to. But instead of this kind of aggressive, vindictive uh, dialogue that you see, I think we're seeing a lot of it in our political sphere right now, history can encourage us to, you know, be more charitable to others, even though we might disagree, even though we might have very strong, firmly held opinions and beliefs. And I believe the Bible is clear about some things. We can still do it in such a way that um, recognizes the humanity in others. Because as we see these people in, in history, we recognize their humanity. Sometimes they succeeded, sometimes they failed. But you know, being open to hearing, <coughs> even if we don't agree. Empathy. Kind of putting ourselves in those, the shoes of those people. Thinking about what would it have been like for uh, someone in the past, right? Somebody, you know, in the, the Middle Ages, for example. You know, thinking about you know, the opportunities we have to examine God's work are immensely larger than what they did in the, in the Middle Ages. And the fact that we can carry it with us, uh, the fact that we can have so many different versions in, in words we can read and understand easily. But then when we understand, you know, okay, here is you know, the Middle Ages and they believed in these things. Oh, those are crazy ideas. Why didn't they just turn into this passage and understand that this, this teaching is wrong? Well, they, they didn't have that opportunity. And so, you know, kind of empathizing, under, you know, understanding and, and, and putting yourselves in those shoes of those people. But then also I think that encourages us in our contemporary society as we interact with people, um, you know, to have that empathy as well. So let's now turn to the nuts and bolts of the course and, and thinking about what we're going to be doing over the next 16 weeks. In 16 weeks, it is going to be a challenge to cover uh, you know, 14 centuries worth of church history. Uh, I teach survey of church history, which is the entirety from the first century to the 21st century. And that's difficult. Well, it's still difficult even though we're looking at a smaller chunk. And so we're not going to be able to spend a lot of time in any one particular period where we can really get into depth about some of these things. But instead, we're going to try and, you know, that kind of 10,000 level plane flight, right, over this period of time. You know, seeing the things that were uh, maybe made the most impact but not getting too deep in any one particular era. We'll be looking at people, but we'll also be looking at movements and, and developments, beliefs, practices, political changes, cultural changes, all of those kind of things. But ultimately, I hope that through some of these assignments, it will invite you, encourage you to think critically about your maybe your own faith, the faith of the congregation, or the life of the congregation that you're a part of, and thinking about, okay, you know, oh, I can see how this is you know, a product of you know, these things that we talked about in class, uh, and, and some of those uh, better understanding types of things. Essentially, we'll be moving through um, five different periods. So that's kind of the overall, we'll be moving these kind of chunks. Uh, next week on uh, Tuesday, Lord willing, and Thursday, we'll be looking at backgrounds to Christianity. Uh, thinking about the Roman, Greek, and to some extent the Jewish context out of which Christianity develops. Uh, and then also kind of uh, thinking about what are some things that are like important philosophies that will later affect Christianity from the Greeks, for example. Then we'll move into the second chunk, which is the first four centuries. Although there's a lot of change that takes place between the time of Jesus and the year 300, there is a way in which 
there is a significant change that happens in that fourth century that shapes everything afterward. And so we'll kind of use that as a boundary marker for that first or for that second block. Right? So the first century through the fourth. Then we'll move to the early Middle Ages, so about the year 400 or so to about the year 800 is where we'll cap it off. And then from about 800 to 1200 will be the later Middle Ages, 1200 to uh, 1500 or so will be the pre-Reformation period, right? So some of the changes that will take place. You know, in this section we'll get into the Renaissance and some of the things that the Renaissance brought about, but also led to uh, the Reformation. So we'll kind of end with pointing towards and this idea of, you know, some significant changes are getting ready to take place, but here are the, you know, the, the setting of the stage, so to speak, is where we'll end it up. With each of these sections, we're going to, instead of do a chronological sweep most of the time. We're going to be more thematic within these periods. And so instead of going, right, here are the things that exactly happened in the first century in order, here's the second century, uh, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to be looking at uh, topical groupings. And so for so for the first section, right, the first four centuries, we'll, we'll look at second century, third century, fourth century, each separately. But within that, we'll look at political developments related to Christianity. All right. How did Christianity and poli politics interact during this time period? Uh, you know, what was the political thinking of Christians? Right. Early on, of course, it's going to be Christianity looking in to the Roman Empire or the Roman Empire acting on Christianity. But once we get into the Middle Ages, of course, Christianity and the state are united. And so that will give us a different view uh, of all of that. Secondly, uh, we'll pay attention to the interaction between culture and society and Christianity. So how do you view as a Christian, or how did they view? Good time to remind us to silence our cell phones before we come to class. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize. Usually I uh, usually I remember that. So. All right. Where was it? Culture and society. So, how do you, as Christian, or how did they, as Christians, view um, Greek philosophy? Right, so here you have this philosophical system that's pretty entrenched in the, in the pagan model. Right, how do you approach that? Do you stay as far away from it as possible? Uh, do you welcome it right, and try to find ways of agreement? Right? And so Jesus taught this, but you know Aristotle also taught this, and it's kind of the same thing. Right? Aristotle's prime mover, ruler, prime mover is the same as the Christian God. Right? Do you try to meld them like that? And, and obviously there were people that said one thing, people said the other. And, but we'll look at those kind of things, right? Especially as Christianity becomes a part of the state, the Roman Empire. Right? What's, the, what's the relationship between church and state? Right? These are the kind of things we'll be looking at in that culture and society section. The third part of those blocks will be looking at doctrine and, and doctrinal developments. What what new doctrines developed? What ways did Christians change some doctrines? Or what doctrines became extremely important during this period that may not have been emphasized as much before? And then finally, uh, practice. Well, what was it the thing, what, what things did Christians do? How did they do them? How was that different than previous generations in, in those periods as we're looking through them? And so as we go through each of those periods, we'll be asking those kind of questions about those kind of developments. And then sometimes we'll be talking about geographic spread. Um, sometimes it, it's not really um, vital to talk about that, and so it'll depend on, on the period. But those first four are, are the ones we'll spend a lot of time about. 
There are two textbooks record, uh, required for the class. You will want to get them as soon as possible. Uh, this, this is the first time I'm using this one, uh, Everett Ferguson's Church History uh, from Christ to the Pre-Reformation. Um, this is the second edition. Ferguson, uh, well known as a New Testament scholar, um, wrote a book on backgrounds to Christianity, which is phenomenal. I'll be using that as a uh, as, as a source for a lot of the stuff we'll talk about, but I, you know, I really recommend that if you don't have a copy of Backgrounds to Early Christianity by Everett Ferguson, uh, you know, and you're interested in this, or uh, you know, as a Bible major looking to be a minister, you know, that's a really good uh, source to have as your uh, in your library, um, and because it goes through in great detail Greco-Roman backgrounds, Jewish backgrounds, um, and a wide variety of things. But also, you know, in this case, uh, providing us some, some history, right? providing us broader than the backgrounds. And so, uh, going through it, it's, it's very readable. Um, you know, he tries not to get bogged down with too much, uh, you know, very um, specific language, but, or if he does, he tries to explain it. Um, so, hopefully you'll find this a, an interesting read. We'll talk more about assignments based on that. Uh, the second textbook uh, is much smaller. Right? It's very thin. Also by Ferguson, uh, called The Rule of Faith. When we get into the second, third, fourth century, we'll see this development within Christianity. It's a doctrinal development. Referred to as the Rule of Faith, or sometimes uh, referred to by uh, different names, but essentially it's this, this idea of a summation of apostolic preaching. Right? This is what the apostles taught in a very nice, organized way that you could easily present to someone, especially if you, uh, you, know, you weren't uh, literate, where you could read the New Testament, it'd be easy to remember, or at least some points to remember. And so Ferguson, in this book, spends some time talking about the rule of faith, its development over those centuries, but then also um, makes some discussion about the rule of faith for modern times. Is there a place in our contemporary society for the rule of faith and how that thing uh, may or may not be useful to the contemporary Christian? And we'll talk about here in a minute uh, how, how we're going to incorporate that textbook. Of course, a lot of what we're talking about, uh, coming from the syllabus at this point, the syllabus available on Blackboard, we're going to get a lot of the highlights, but I would encourage you to spend some time looking at that, um, refreshing your mind about some of the things we'll talk about here. And then, of course, you know, as we go through the semester, referring to it uh, frequently. But in every class, of course, you will have this section in the syllabus referred to as the course objectives section which is simply a statement of, at the end of this course, there are some things that I want you to know, some things I want you to do, some things that I want you to value. Well, it's these things. Right? At the end of the course, I want you to be able to talk about some people. Right? And so if Ignatius ever comes up in a conversation, you know who they're talking about. Right? Uh, if, you know, if some sort of conversation comes up in a Bible class, and, uh, you know, you can, you know, oh, well, that was, you know, in the, in the Middle Ages, they had this disagreement about such and such. And so that's the kind of stuff I'm wanting to know. And then also talk about, you know, what kind of impact have those things made on contemporary Christianity? How, uh, how have politics, philosophy, culture intertwined or been opposed by Christianity? Uh, and then also thinking about what did what Christians did at the, and said at these various times, is that good, is that bad, is it scriptural, is it theological, is it not? I mean, so hopefully being able to do that as well will be a, a part of this course. So that's kind of where, I'm, where we're heading, and that's what I'm trying to uh, help you get to. In order to evidence that to me, there are some things that we're going to be doing this semester that will demonstrate that you can talk about those things. 
And we'll talk more about each of these here uh, a little bit more explicitly. The first is chapter summaries of Ferguson. So, beginning with chapter three, um, you'll be expected to summarize each of the chapters in Ferguson. Um, just, I'll give you more guidelines as to how I'm, what I'm looking for, et cetera. I'll provide you with an example. Right? Instead of doing reading quizzes, I mean, the other option I could do reading quizzes, but I decided I wanted to do chapter summaries because uh, you know I want you to kind of engage this more fully. Um, the chapter summaries will be due before each of the major exams. So, uh, you know, the, the Tuesday, before, like the first exam is on a Thursday, the Tuesday before, and you will, all of the chapter summaries will be given. You can do them prior to that, obviously, but that's kind of how it will break down. So, prior to each of the exams. I'll provide samples on Blackboard of what I'm looking for. Certainly not looking for you to copy everything. Right? This is a summary. So you're putting it in your own words in a smaller form. Secondly, it's important for uh, you to show up, to be able to talk, respond, ask questions, answer questions in class. Uh, now I'm talking here, of course, to the face-to-face -face students. The online situation is a little bit different, and so online students should refer to the syllabus as far as how the attendance and participation works. But essentially, in, you know, some of you have had me for classes before, and I've not really changed this policy. You get a certain number of points for every day you show up. Uh, you can miss up to two classes without any sort of excuse before it affects your grade. Um, you know, so that's a way to kind of encourage you to be in class, encourage you to be ready for class. For uh, the rule of faith, um, what I'm going to ask you to do with that is to develop a reflection essay, which is due toward the end of the semester. In the reflection essay, and we'll, I'll provide you more guidelines as we get closer, you're going to be asked to summarize first. What's his argument? What's he trying to claim? And what's the evidence or what's the reasoning he uses to make that claim? I mean, especially in the context of, you know, is he saying we should adopt the rule of faith or we shouldn't? Right? This is for some, some time or this is for all time. And then also for you to reflect on that in your own view. Do you agree with him? Do you disagree with him? Why? How can the rule of faith be useful, or how could it not be useful? Or if we adopt this view, then that would lead us to X, Y, Z. Right? So this kind of critical reflection on what Ferguson is claiming. Again, more uh, guidelines will be given later. There will also be additional writing assignments throughout the semester. I'm going this route instead of having to do a research paper. And so these smaller types of writing assignments instead of that one huge big one. What I'm going to ask you to do is read some primary source material from Christians from this time period. We'll try to line them up so that, you know, as they're due, it's somebody we've just talked about or, or something we've just talked about. Uh, these writings will be available online. There is a, a website known as the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, ccel.org, that is a storehouse for all sorts of writings from Christians from, you know, the earliest times, uh, even up until the 1700s, 1800s, uh, even some in the 1900s. So uh, you, you don't have another book to buy. It'll be accessing them for free online. Uh, and doing a similar type of thing. It's kind of a reflection on what's this person saying? And is there anything here that this person's saying that is useful for contemporary Christianity? Right? Or is, what, you know, what do you think about this, this view? Right? Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? Why? Right? And so again, primary sources, um, providing a little bit of a summary, and then that analytical component of what do you think about, right? Don't just tell me what they said. I want to see that. But then I also want to see what you think about what they said. There will be an opportunity for six, for you to submit six of those essays. You only have to do five. And so if you don't want to, as far as, I mean, I guess in a sense you don't have to do any of them. But if you want to pass the class, 
if you want to get the most points possible, you should do five of them. Right. Um, and, you know, whichever five you choose. But uh, if you do that sixth one, I will take the five best and then add additional points to your final grade. So there is a benefit to doing all six of them. Uh, but as far as, you know, if you do five of them, it's not going to hurt you. Uh, more information and the specific sources will be up um, by the end of next week. Uh, hopefully by the beginning of next week. But uh, it'll, by the end of next week, you'll have the, the lists, the links, all those kinds of things. There will be three exams. Uh, in the course, um, two unit exams and a final. The dates for the unit exams are September 15th and October 20th. Again, prior to that, those dates, the, uh, the summaries of those chapters will be due. Uh, there will be a study guide available at least two weeks, if not more, before that to hopefully help you prepare, but also give you time to ask questions. You know, you say, okay, okay, can you help me figure out what I'm supposed to say here? Uh, the exams, and again, several of you have had me before, and so it's very similar in the sense that there will be some multiple choice and short answer, and there will be a relatively brief essay question, and long paragraph, right? I'm not talking pages, um, but uh, you know, an essay question there as well. And again, all that information will be on the study guide. The final exam is on December 6th, so we're already thinking, all right. <laughs> There it is. That's the date we're shooting for. It will be comprehensive in one sense, um, but you know, not totally comprehensive. Right? And so the comprehensive part will be larger themes, larger developments. Uh, you know, and it'll be kind of a, it'll be focused on an essay question to ask you to pull some things together, where it won't be like, you know, which of the following demonstrates the Chalcedonian opinion of the unity of Christ. Hopefully you'll know what that means when that exam comes up. Uh, but, you know, it, it'll be comprehensive in that it'll ask you to kind of trace, like, the development of thinking about Jesus and, and the nature of Jesus, which is one thing we'll see a lot about. Right? How, how can Jesus be both God and human? Um, it'll be a little bit longer. There'll be a study guide as well for that. We'll say much more as we get closer to each of those dates. Here's the, core, the, the breakdown for the grades um, as to what each is valued. Again, doing it out of a thousand points is a way to make sure that no one assignment, doing poorly on one assignment, even doing poorly on a unit exam, will ruin your grade. Right? And so it kind of balances out the risk a little bit. But if you don't submit the chapter summaries, you don't show up to class, you do poorly on the exam, it's going to add up. But, you know, this way it keeps it kind of balanced. Uh, and also with, with it not being percentages, it's a little bit easier to figure out your grade. Uh, instead of trying to say, okay, the, the quizzes are worth 40%, but the test is worth 30%, and so the addition and, and addition and subtraction are a little bit easier. Especially as you're thinking about, okay, what, what am I trying to get for? Usually this becomes an issue, like, the, uh, the week before the final. What do I need to get on the final? <laughs> in order to, you know. but that way at any point during the semester you can kind of figure out where you are uh, and how you're doing. By all means, if at any point in the semester you have a question about that, come talk to me. You know, let's let's sit down and think about okay, you know, where are you now? What do you need to do to, to improve? Uh, we talked about attendance already. Uh, four points today. You can miss up to two. Unexcused. I don't need to know where you are. You don't need to explain it to me. If there's an excused absence, you know, talk to me about that. If you do miss that eighth class, you could end up with an FA in the course, right? So, you know, showing up is, is important uh, there. And again, for those of you that are online, you want to check out the syllabus for how it's slightly different for the online students. Makeup work. Uh, you know, if you have to miss an exam, if something else comes up uh, and it's excused, right, you know, you got called into jury duty, uh, funeral, um, you know, those kind of things, 
you have to give with me. Let me know as soon as possible. That way we can make make adjustments, make sure that we have the opportunity to um, make that up in a timely manner. All right. I don't have a problem with you using. Now this again, this is more. You know, I, for those that are online, I'm not going to see them <laughs> if they're texting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I would say, you know, still not to be distracted while you're watching the videos. Um, but especially for the face-to-face, -face, you know, if you want to use a laptop or your iPad or whatever to take notes, that's fine. Just make sure you're focused on that and not being distracted by uh, a variety of other things that you could get distracted by. So, uh, you know, if you do use your electronic devices, please make sure it's for class-related and it's uh, uses. If there is something wrong with a grade I turn back to, well, I should say, if you believe that I have misgraded something, I mean, there might be, I don't like this grade, but if you think I've misgraded it, uh, you know, I, maybe I've, I've made a mistake in grading a multiple choice question, or, or maybe, uh, you know, I was looking at an essay, and, oh, you didn't see this point that I made here. Um, please get in contact with me about that. I'm willing to, to go back over and look at it and make sure that I graded you fairly, make sure I'm grading consistently with everyone, whether it's online or the face-to-face -face class. But the university policy is you need to get in contact with me within three days after it's turned back to you. So once, the, once it's graded and released back to you, then you have three days to look it over, and if there is a question, uh, come back to me about that. And so uh, make sure uh, you get in contact with me about that if that applies. Since we are not doing a research paper, None of the written assignments that you are required to do requires any outside sources. And some, uh, I mean, other than what we've talked about, right? The primary source essays, the two textbooks. You don't have to do any sort of other research. But if you do look at another source to help you understand one of the assignments, and the source influences what you write, make sure to include the right work cited page. Right? And so if if you're using outside sources, make sure you're citing that information. And don't use somebody else's work as your own and not give them credit for it. And so if you have questions about how to cite something, get in contact with me. That's a much better conversation than, oh, by the way, I found a website that you used that you didn't cite. And that's a different conversation and not a good one. Um, so, you know, if you have questions about, you know, I couldn't really understand what was going on in this situation, so I looked at this website. How do I cite it in my paper? All right, well, here's how you do it. Much better. Right? So come to me. You do not need to. All I'm looking for you to do is to read these things, use your brain, put it on a page. And that's all you have to do. You don't need to do any sort of research. Um, so you know, if you do, however, use someone else's work. Right? This ultimately comes down to an issue of integrity, not just okay, I'll make sure that for my academic career I check this box. It's also about who you are as a person, right? who I am as a person, right? that I give credit where it's due, where I honestly do my own work. I would much rather see you do your best work and it end up being a C than for you to take somebody else's work, claim it as your own, you know, and it would be a quote unquote a paper, but when I discover that you've done that, then you're going to get an F. All right, so I want to see what you can do, and so do your best. So if you're struggling with an assignment, or you're not sure how to do an assignment, uh, or what to say, contact me. Right? Touch me before or after class. Come by during office hours. Send me an email. Right? Whatever I can do to help you as you go through these assignments. If you need any sort of academic accommodations uh, because of a documented learning disability, uh, make sure to contact Project T. And if this applies to you, you probably already know that, and so you've probably already done that. But if you haven't, make sure to do that so the date can get the information to me uh, as soon as possible so we make the accommodations that you need. My office hours this semester are 1040 to 2, Mondays and Wednesdays, 830 to 945 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm also in my office a lot of other times as well. So if you have class during those times, you work during those times, and need some other time 
you know, let me know. We can make arrangements. Uh, if it's something that is simple and can be handled by email, feel free to email me. Uh, I try to respond to emails within 24 hours. If you have not heard from me within 48 hours, then you know, get in contact with me again. Perhaps something got misplaced. It got, you know, I, I read it, but I forgot to respond to it. I mean, there, there could be anything that happened, but if you haven't heard from me within two days about it, about an issue or a question or whatever, feel free to get in touch with me and say, you know, I emailed this, this to you on Monday, uh, you know, just in case you didn't see it, could you tell me X, Y, Z? What questions do you have? I've thrown a lot at you and didn't really pause as I intended to. Uh, <laughs> Again, we'll say more about the exams and these, these writing assignments as we get closer to time. Um, again, several of you have had me in other classes, and it's probably similar to some other assignments you've had there. I think I've missed, what are the five essays on? I will provide on Blackboard links to the writings, sections of the writings of some of these early Christians. Okay. And so you just click on the link, and it'll tell you, read these five paragraphs, ten paragraphs, whatever. Other questions? All right, if not, we'll go ahead and end there today, and we'll pick up again on Tuesday looking at the backgrounds of Christianity.